Right. So um, welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for coming and uh, getting into our little uh, hotter house here. Uh, I was briefly introduced, but suffice it to say, I'm uh, part of the team at, at Fabric Ventures, so especially thankful for you uh, all joining us, and especially thankful because, of course, I stand between you and lunch, I think. Also stand between me and lunch, this is also important. Um, uh, so, uh, but I think we have like about, about 25 minutes. Um, so, um, a lot of you probably think that already kind of the internet and the web has had a pretty fundamental impact um, on your lives. But, uh, you know, we would suggest at Fabric that actually you ain't seen nothing yet and that the impact of this next phase is going to have a fundamental impact across you know, politics, across your personal life, uh, the very fabric indeed of society, and um, that one way of thinking about that um, is to follow the money, as the age-old saying goes, and to look at how uh, capitalism is going to be impacted by this next uh, wave and, and understand some of, um, or share some of our thinking in, in that space. Um, so this is a, a little piece of art that actually was constructed in honor of the dreamers in the States, those folks who were brought to the uh, United States um, as a ch uh, children and there might have had or might still have their kind of fortunes dashed by a kind of a very jagged, uh, sharpie signature uh, at any uh, point in time. Uh, oh, sorry, someone was appearing on my screen, the, uh, playing with it. Um, and, um, you know, I think what it represents is that what is at the very core of being a human is that, that desire to, to dream. Um, and, and indeed, um, I've been uh, messing around trying to build and back companies in the technology space for the last 25 years. Uh, and dreaming of doing that uh, the 10 years before that and, and started, in fact, uh, with my first company with, with my brother, Charlie. Um, and, you know, we can all think of the things of which we dream. We think of, uh, you know, happiness, of course, and fun, and we think of a uh, sustainable uh, future for the planet, uh, fairness amongst our kind of, you know, fellow me uh, women and men. Um, but, it, you know, the, the truth is... Uh, and we can actually tether those uh, to the UN Sustainability Goals, and I've sort of got my uh, uh, badge on. Uh, but the truth is that, you know, whether or not that's achievable is down uh, to the individual. Um, and, you know, the, indiv the individual is the unit at which sort of everything occurs. Um, it is uh, important that we embrace the... Uh, the power of the individual, the diversity of the individual, the ability of the individual to know what it, that woman or man is up to and to, to mask the risks involved in that, uh, even in, the, in, in this uh, uh, particular uh, instance. Um, and, but I think it goes beyond that, that it is the, the voice of that kind of sovereign individual that can actually animate beings um, and can uh, restructure uh, the tyrannical order of the world uh, when that becomes necessary. So pretty critical. But it is also true that collectively, you know, we can achieve a lot more. That if we come together in companies of uh, women and men, that uh, that can be more effective. And so uh, it came to pass in uh, 1494, uh, I believe, uh, that Luca Pacioli uh, published a book called Summa di Arithmetica, which is this book here, um, which captured the extremely interesting um, topic of double-entry bookkeeping uh, for the first uh, time, along with other principles of the firm and of, of companies. And so this is seen by many as the kind of advent of capitalism. Um, and actually, if you uh, care to kind of also enjoy in capitalism of another form, uh, I think tomorrow, in fact, you can buy a copy of this book uh, in an auction at Christie's um, for a couple of million dollars. Um, so, you know, get there quickly. You can get your phones out and put in a, a sort of a remote bid. With Bitcoin, prob I mean, probably, Christie's are pretty advanced. Um, so then the next thing that happened, there was a, a gentleman called Jean-Baptiste Says who actually uh, encapsulated the primacy of markets in a book he published in 1803, and that these markets should remain free and unfettered. Um, and you could get to the end of the last century, and there are a few of us in this room who would remember quite distinctly 
when Fa Francis Fukuyama pronounced the, uh, the end of history with the, the victory of Western liberal democracy and capitalism over uh, at least the, the Soviet communist empire. Um, so um, we should be enjoying this very extreme form of capitalism that we, we uh, all live within. We should be enjoying the fact that uh, you know, almost half of our po uh, world's population lives with under the uh, benevolent dominion of um, Emperor Zuck and, and Facebook. We should also be enjoying the fact that um, half of the purchases that go on, uh, take place online uh, pass through uh, this sort of trumped up uh, bookstore. We should be also enjoying the fact that essentially every single thought that we have almost because we believe, um, perhaps not always justifiably, that what we type into Google is not you know, being observed. Um, you know, whether that is a whim or a fear or personal insecurity or even a uh, uh, potentially malevolent intent, you know, that all goes into to Google, and we should be enjoying that. But do we, do we feel like this is the future of which we dreamed? Is it not true that we're all... Um, uh, feel a little bit like we have become the product ourselves, that we have given up our, our data and become enslaved to these, uh, these networks, uh, or indeed, if we're not the product ourselves, we're, we're being uh, co-opted to purchase products, often plastic products, that we shouldn't be buying. This is perhaps not the future that we were all um, after. On top of that, there's another wave going on, targeted by this gentleman, uh, Andrew Yang, um, who identified in what he believes was the kind of fundamental reason that the current president uh, was elected, that is to say the kind of hollowing out of jobs within middle America, initially through the automation of you know, you know, manual tasks, but you know, obviously, as we know, and we can probably see on many stages here uh, in these few days, is moving up into repetitive tasks through, you know, from knowledge workers, and will very soon, of course, encompass even very specialized skills, so from kind of white-collar jobs even to gold-collar jobs. And I think uh, what is already happening there, uh, I don't think this is even a phrase, but let's call them steel-collar jobs, jobs that could never have been done uh, by people, but are now being done by, if you will, machines. So uh, this is a very big issue. And I think maybe even the biggest issue is um, that, and it's been oft referred to as a kind of an echo chamber, um, that when we find ourselves in a situation where our emotions are so uh, distorted uh, by the, the everyday experiences we have uh, in our kind of digital realm, that we're not actually in a good position to even judge whether or not we're being deceived and dragged in uh, the wrong direction. Uh, our reason has perhaps even left us, and um, many people who uh, otherwise are sort of civilized and well-intended get dragged into wasting time on Instagram and show ponying around, or you know, suffer you know, real fear uh, from the prospect of opening uh, their inbox and looking at the emails that are attacking them there. So it's, 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 it's wrong at a pretty fundamental uh, level. So that's fine and well and good, but why is it that we might be at some kind of tipping point in this? So, um, look, I don't want to be too uh, trite and to bash Zuck. That's not what I'm here to do. He's done an incredible job in all sorts of uh, amazing ways of building a, comp a company that has benefited a lot of people. Um, you know, but it is true that he's now being dragged up in front of Congress. That is true that the um, antitrust authorities are looking at not just his company, but many of the tech titans to address what's going on here. Is it too uh, monopolistic? It is true that finally we're seeing uh, GDPR within Europe uh, protecting EU citizens wherever they are uh, in the digital sphere and, and around the world. Um, and of course, in terms of hacks and the, the danger to our kind of personal and private data, that's become so frequent as to become a little bit boring and, and, and normalized. Um, but, you know, fundamentally, there's an extreme form of capitalism here that has evolved that needs tempering, not throwing out, but, but tempering. Um, and to, to fight some of those self-reinforcing effects. So dreams are good. Dreams have led us here. Um, uh, but how can we rethink the way in which we organize ourselves to, in pursuit of those dreams 
perhaps to do a slightly better job. So let's cast our minds back a little bit. A little bit. I don't think any of us quite remember here. Or well, there could be some combination of Glastonbury and Burning Man or that, that kind of... Uh, if we ca cast our minds back a little bit, sort of paleo Paleolithic, you know, hunter-gatherer kind of uh, times, um, in that, that village or that tribe, uh, there were a couple of characteristics I want to point to. Well, first of all, folks didn't uh, specialize particularly. They covered a number of different bases. You were fishing, you were hunting, you were gathering, you were protecting, you were laying the fire. There were many things you had to do. You were a small, a small unit. And it was a very agile organization. If opportunities came up or challenges, you just reorganized to address them rapidly. And you trusted everybody in that village very implicitly. Now, we moved then into cities. And at city scale, it was possible for the eco economies, or the economics rather, to work for specialization. And it became necessary at that scale also for there to be intermediaries, to be third parties that you relied upon uh, to trust to, in order to, tr to interact and transact with other people in that city. And this was driven by technological advances, um, uh, obviously like transport and et cetera, et cetera. But, and that concept of a city and those trusted third parties was further magnified by the advent of the internet. But what we really ended up with was a global city with all of the benefits, but all of the downsides uh, of that in addition. And so what we believe is that you know, the, how we organize ourselves is also another defining characteristic of uh, us as a species. And that whilst Web 1 and Web 2 has um, magnified and scaled up the city to the globe, what Web 3 can do, and I've actually added here a fourth wave of computing in honor of some of the really fantastic presentations that have taken place over the last couple of days uh, on sort of the core technologies around this, it, what this phase can do can help us organize in a different way and actually um, move from a situation where we have to explicitly uh, engineer trust between parties to one where we can uh, implicitly trust any participants in a network, returning us to some of those benefits of agility uh, that we had in the, in the village. So therefore constructing uh, this global village. So that sounds good. Uh, but I think it goes um, importantly beyond that because at the heart of that move towards Web3 is not just that ability to organize you know, through that Im those implicit trust bonds, but it's also that you create this new um, human-centric personal identity that you can carry with you. And what we believe that will help unlock uh, is the vast quantity of data that is now being produced uh, in this new wave of computing. So in fact, the, the quantity of data that's being produced is way outstripping our ability to find you know, not just a bunch of data, it's not about big data, but it's about the right data at the right time for, for a specific problem and with the right level of currency. Data, you know, it decays, it has a half-life. And so we think those technologies are going to help us significantly with tackling that. And um, you might ask, well, you know, why does that matter? Well, if you could organize yourself and you've got the right data that you can access and algorithms can access, you can hopefully build, we can hopefully build, a whole suite of much more human-centric um, computing services, but services, because we're happy to give up more of our data, because that can be used more effectively uh, to deliver those services to it. And we're going to come to some examples. Um, so with that ability to have implicit trust, um, uh, with the, bit, the ability actually to represent ownership of this pretty much every type through tokens, with the uh, um, uh, ability to uh, actually transact using inter internet sovereign money, uh, sort of super low friction and, and a, a digital money that is native to this new economy. Um, and with the ability to use all of those together to provide incentives and to coordinate people at scale, that's how we're going to deliver on these very human, this next wave of human centric uh, services. So, where are we with all of that? So, um, Bitcoin, I guess, was more than an experiment, more than a proof of concept. It seems to have found a position as a, a store of value uh, that continues to unfold. So uh, uh, that certainly, uh, at least on Twitter, uh, the source of much debate. Um, 
Uh, and then we saw the advent of Ethereum, and Ethereum, uh, woo, <laughs> more, more shouts. We can you have a few people to take sides, or just whoop. Um, Ethereum uh, has gone out there and created a, a, this generalized platform for executing these, these smart contracts and seems to be finding perhaps some particular traction around decentralized and open finance, in itself a very exciting and powerful uh, application. Um, and then we, um, we believe we're kind of entering this next phase where there are a lot of very significant projects, uh, you know, Cosmos, Polkadot, Augur, very many projects coming live uh, on the Ethereum mainnet and other alternatives to um, uh, both Bitcoin and Ethereum and complements to them that are coming live, very significant pieces of engineering that, you know, weren't dreamt up during the ICO craze and people have hired away and thrown together a bit of Python and some Visual Basic or something. It, it, people have been working on these uh, you know, the fundamental inventions in computer science coupled with many years of development and those are going live now. And then on top of that, you've actually got, you know, the interest of, I mean, Facebook creating its own cryptocurrency. You've got uh, Apple introducing much better, better crypto primitives to its, you know, iOS uh, capabilities that are developer toolkit. Um, uh, and it's, you know, respecting the importance of privacy around sign-in through its uh, Apple ID uh, initiative. Um, and then uh, you've also got players like Samsung making it possible to handle private keys um, in, in your phone. So we think these are, these are very significant steps that are going to lead to the next, next wave of, of applications. But you could say that, look, whilst the total sort of FANGM, whatever acronym you want to use, um, a market cap of that, those tech titans is many, many trillions, at this point in time, we've only got... Um, a quarter of a trillion uh, to play with and, and to repeat uh, something that Mike Novogratz said on the stage a year ago, which is kind of more or less the price we've actually returned to as well. That's a year ago on the, on the, uh, on the slide there, or the market capitalization rather than the price, I should say. It, it takes more than a quarter of a trillion uh, to change the world. And so uh, there needs to be more vested interest in this, in this economy. So it's, it's, it is only that much at the moment. So is the problem the applications? So other people have been talking very eloquently about all the different applications throughout uh, the day and, the, and these days. Um, you know, and I've already mentioned open finance, and we think that is a, a super uh, exciting and critical one um, you know, within the developed world, but also within, uh, very much within the developing world, providing uh, access. Um, let's leave aside developer tools and infrastructure. Clearly, we can all uh, you know, pay ourselves to build, make the building blocks and make the you know, picks and shovels to build this next wave. That's kind of a, a truism. Um, but the, there are other areas around autonomous vehicles. There are very critical areas about sharing data around healthcare for pharmaceutical companies that are very exciting. Um, just re-jiggling that a little bit. Um, and the thing to observe in all of those, it's they are if you have a situation where there is a lot of data that is owned by many people in a, a kind of long tail of network participants, and hitherto it has been impossible to coordinate them or encourage them to get them feel comfortable with sharing that to tackle really complex problems like, you know, researching the correct diagnosis for or correct uh, treatment for cancer and then diagnosing people at scale. That is, a, you know, an absolutely concrete example. Or we have people in the audience tackling the issues with, um, supply chains, you know, encouraging um, a more efficient and sustainable supply chain by getting e um, enterprises to share more of their, their private or, you know, commercially confidential data in the right way. So if it has that characteristic, then there's a trillion dollar op opportunity out there, we would argue. So what is it going to take to break some of this uh, Web2 hegemony? Um, you know, when you're thinking about a startup, um, it's important to uh, reflect on the fact that this stuff doesn't happen by accident. We all suffer from rose-tinted spectacles. We kind of look back and go, oh, it, you know, it just happened. But what, what actually happens is that, and often the founders, of course, actually even tell that narrative. They say, yeah, we, we worked it out, no, no problem. But actually people look through a number of different options, of ways to unseat the, the incumbents. You know, is it through using regulation? You know, is it through just going directly at them with a better mousetrap? Is it somehow kind of stealthily coming in, for example, building an ID for gaming, and then somehow that becomes the new social network or finance platform? Um, and there are new areas, and then there's, you know, new uh, 
uh, value propositions that sit entirely in the crypto ecosphere um, that are probably uh, a, a way of you know, building something that will unseat the existing players. But it's tough. And so I think it, it's actually instructive to, to think back to what this looked like um, during the Web 2.0 um, phase. Um, and there were similar struggles. Um, so who knows John Doerr? A good smattering. So uh, arguably a reasonably successful venture capitalist who was on uh, the board uh, of, of many f famous companies. And there was one particular company that you probably heard of um, that in the first four years of its existence when it was uh, hemorrhaging cash and it was just actually... Uh, uh, you know, only 20% of the revenue of its sort of one of its closest competitors and hadn't worked out, hadn't cracked the code on its business model and go to market, uh, he was saying this is pretty bleak and they might have to pull the plug and go a different direction. Uh, so that was between 98 and 2002 for Google. But yet, obviously, come 2015, um, it had transformed itself. And in fact, from 98 to 2002, it went from, from that terrible situation, you could argue, uh, within the space of two years, from 2002 to 2004, five thereabouts, uh, to $32 billion in market capitalization. So, you know, before it happens, it's much harder to see. Um, SAS, who recognizes this little logo? Which company? Yeah, Salesforce. So when those guys started out, and they just kind of created a kind of cloud-based, what's a cloud, um, context manager for sale, sales um, reps, which is kind of the, all the product was initially. People were like, the UI is terrible and it is totally uneconomic trying to build um, all of the infrastructure to deliver a SaaS product. This is never going to work. But lo and behold, you know, 15, 20 years later, actually 25% of enterprise revenues for enterprise software, is it comes by virtue of subscriptions for SaaS software. So it's totally over and I'm sure that's continuing to accelerate at the rate at which you see. Too scary, who's going to get into a stranger's car? I like my, la my old kind of diesel guzzling, noisy, you know, uh, taxi cab. Um, uh, whether you love them or hate them, uh, obviously, if we race forward to now, we've got close to $100 billion, unless it's gone down, of um, market cap between sort of Uber and Lyft. Um, and uh, would, we would argue at least maybe the expense of shareholders for the moment, a, a fantastic service for people. So it can be very hard to see um, these disruptions before they happen. Another example mentioned before is this trumped up bookstore. That was how Amazon began. Um, this, you know, not only is this a pretty awful UI by today's standards, it's interesting to be reminded of that, but it, you know, they were taking on very established booksellers with all of the physical distribution for books which are not tremendously high margin. It seemed like a pretty bad idea. Um, but there was an innovation um, that meant that now we probably have about a thousand billion reasons to kind of be uh, like Jeff Bezos. Um, so, you know, it's about 900 billion, the market cap here, so sh a little bit shy of a trillion, but we'll forgive him that. Um, and, um, and he's, and if that little blip on the left, by the way, that was, you can all see, that was uh, the dot com boom. <laughs> um, and, and so that is the kind of full gamut of the, the, the share price of, of Amazon. But one crucial thing he did in setting expectations early and trying to tackle this very complex task was to, was to say to his shareholders that I am going to take the profits and reinvest them in building this network. Um, that, and by doing that, ultimately, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to succeed. And so if you expect to be able to shout at me or you know, deliver dividends in anywhere like the short term, you're going to be disappointed, so you probably want to get off this train. So that was a very successful thing he did there. And that little trick, that way of getting everybody to share more kind of, you know, equally in the kind of future of a complex network like that is actually at the heart of the way in which these new token economies are being built. And so on the slide, you can see a number of the ways in which um, economic models have been built around this Web3 wave of computing. Some of them are still you know, straightforward revenue models where you tax volatility, um, for example, or charge for you know, different services. But many people are now working very hard on a, what would be a whole kind of like genealogy of 
um, different token models uh, that they're combining in order to uh, tackle these very complex networking uh, problems. And one in particular I want to just quickly uh, focus on because this is at the heart of the question of whether or not we can uh, do better um, than today's form of capitalism is the, the work token. So it's a token where you would buy um, as an investor or own as a, a supplier into one of these networks. Um, and by virtue of that ownership, you would have the permission, it's like a work permit, visa, taxi medallion, for participating in work within that network. Um, and an example of what that might be would be video transcoding. So has it, anyone got any idea how this video is getting to the people who are watching it? Or I don't know how many people are watching it, but um, hopefully there are many all over the world live streaming. Um, so that's done through video transcoding. Um, and you know, one way of um, you know, th that network when it's being built needed funding. And so let's just think for a moment about uh, what kind of funding mechanism we would want to build that network. You know, would we want one um, that, in terms of information, you get it kind of every now and then on a monthly basis, or would we want one where we could get it on a real-time basis? Would we want one where you know, the governance was actually delegated to a group of um, uh, possibly unrepresentative people, um, or, or would we actually like to be stakeholders ourselves within the whole thing? Would we like for this to be um, an instrument that was locked down at the beginning and extremely hard to change, or would we like it to be uh, f fully programmable and customizable for what it is you're wanting to do? Would you like it uh, to be multiple stakeholders? You want to organize um, everybody and give them an incentive to participate in this network, uh, or do you know, we want to be just the investors, or do we want to involve suppliers and potentially even users as well? The philosophy around these things, do we want them to be uh, a situation where you have that division fundamentally between shareholders and, and everybody else, a them and us mentality, or is it one for mutual uh, benefit, if you will, a kind of uh, move towards modern mutualization? Uh, despite the efforts of the unions we've, uh, and even the efforts of people building, uh, building societies, capitalism has managed to stomp on a lot of that. I think we can do uh, better. And then ultimately, do we want to have just simple uh, carrot mechanisms or could we have a little balance of carrot and sti stick? That's essentially meaning that people who own a, a token that is native to a network have some skin in the game. So they, they have to think how to be honorable stakeholders and participants in that network. So there's a comparison. and. On the left, you've got a description of an equity share. And you know, on the right, you have the description of a work token, a summary. And you know, we, we, has, we see already and we can see how all of the great characteristics of equity can be uh, retained, but some better characteristics can now be programmed, if you will, within work tokens, and we can tackle these problems. And those are two concrete examples. There's a very strong player in the centralized transcoding market, and there's um, a protagonist in the decentralized transcoding market, uh, live pit. And that is, a, um, that is not investment advice. Um, so uh, it's getting hot in here, as predicted. Um, what we're saying here is that, that this is an opportunity, it's a time for the pendulum to swing back from extreme forms of capitalism and a central control and authority to something that is uh, more decentralized in its organizational structure and allows for a more emergent forms of creativity and governance that comes from the individuals because uh, ultimately that's the, the way in which we're going to succeed in what are likely to be con continue to be turbulent times. And round about the time that Luca Pacioli uh, was writing his book, Summa de Arithmetica, um, another chap called Leonardo was coming up with this very balanced human being. Please forgive the fact that he's male and naked, but um, it, it, this very balanced citizen, this Renaissance uh, citizen and a Vitruvian man. And we think that um, we, we can move forward from here and ultimately end up with a kind of more balanced society and, and citizenship for Vitruvian crypto citizen around education, voting, around a form of modern mutualization or collective capitalism, around uh, an involvement in, in your own personal health and the collective health, health of society, um, and one that if we work hard at it, that even if there is automation, we see everywhere around us, and 
uh, certain types of jobs go away. There can be a safety net created through uh, sh the sharing of our data and a data dividend and maybe even a universal uh, basic income as Andrew Yang would like to propose. Thank you very much.